I didn't exactly lie. I just didn't tell the whole truth when the police car pulled me over. I was driving 75 or maybe 80 miles per hour on a stretch of freeway where the speed limit was set to a safe 45 miles per hour because it was a construction zone. I'm a neuropsychologist, and I examine and rehabilitate people with traumatic brain injuries, most of the time because of motor vehicle accidents. So I tend to respect speed limits. I especially respect speed limits in construction zones because I've seen the damage a speeding car can do to an unprotected road worker's brain and body. But this morning, I was speeding, and the traffic cop had me dead to rights. There was no use denying the truth of my excess propulsion this morning. I was late. I was very late. The traffic was heavy. I was going somewhere I had never been before, and as I often do, I had gotten lost several times before I locked onto the right path. It was a path intended to take me to the courthouse door. Ironically, I was already heading to court, scheduled to testify in a death penalty hearing. As the police officer approached my car, I glanced at the official looking file that was sitting next to me in the passenger seat. It contained notes for what was to be my expert witness testimony, the testimony that I was supposed to be giving at this very moment in front of the judge, the jury, the attorneys, and the family members, all of whom were still a full hour away. That's how late I was. Judges don't like it when you're late to their court. I was truly more afraid of the judge I had yet to meet than I was of the white police officer standing now at my car window. You in a hurry, the officer asked, and what under other circumstances I would have thought was a fake southern drawl. Not hesitating even a moment, I blurted it all out. Yes, sir, I am in a hurry. I'm an expert witness. I'm supposed to be testifying in court right now. It's a death penalty case. I pointed to the official-looking file in the passenger's seat, and then I added, because I thought it would help, the person killed was a police officer. Now, that wasn't a lie. It just wasn't the whole truth. And it did help. The traffic cop didn't bother to take my license. He didn't ask me to get out of my car. He didn't run a computer check on my license plate. Instead, he returned to his vehicle, pulled it in front of mine, turned on his flashing emergency lights, motioned me to follow, and escorted me to the courthouse door at 75 miles per hour. I hadn't lied. I just hadn't told the entire truth. It was a death penalty case. The victim was a white police officer, and the perpetrator was a black man. He was a drug addict, a thief, and ultimately a convicted murderer. And I was late for my testimony. All this the traffic cop knew, but what he did not know and what I did not tell was that I was there to testify for the defense, to testify for the convicted murderer's plea for leniency on the grounds of diminished intellectual capacity, to support his attempt to escape a death sentence. I was there to save a life, not to get revenge for the life that had been lost. To say that black lives matter and to mean it is to say the hard thing. They matter all the time. They matter not just when that black life is educated, degreed, well-spoken, upstanding, inoffensive, law-abiding, non-threatening, and smiling. Black lives matter all the time, just like everyone else's. You don't have to be perfect for your life to matter. You can be uneducated, non-degreed, and barely able to string a sentence together and still matter. You can be criminal, threatening, and angry, and still matter. 
because that is the kind of society we've chosen to create for all of us. We are to be judged not by how we treat our most exalted, but by how we treat those whom we judge to be the least among us. If black lives matter, they must matter all the time. I don't care how many times you've been arrested or what you've been arrested for, you don't die with the hard knee of indifference pressed against the soft, vulnerable flesh of your neck. You don't die like a deer in the headlights of a pickup truck just because you went jogging in the wrong neighborhood. You matter all the time, and yet we, black men and women, do continue to die in these and other most inauspicious ways. Don't say black lives matter if you don't mean the hard thing. The hard thing being that black lives matter all the time, just as your life matters. I wonder when we say it, if we're saying the whole truth, I wonder if we are choosing just as I did with that traffic cop to leave part of our story out. I wonder if we mean the whole hard thing. That is the thing I resolve to mean. And I will ask you to join me in that resolution. I will ask you to join me in meaning the hard thing when you say that my life, that my black life matters. For it is not something that I need to earn. It is not something that is gifted to me. It is a privilege of my birth, a privilege that flows from my mere existence. To be human and to be alive is to have the privilege of mattering. Can I get an amen? Don, I, I didn't hear much. I think some people may be a little confused by the technology we're using this morning, which is understandable. We've had some glitches. Technology is complicated. Some of you probably think that we are on the Zoom machine. We are not. We are on the YouTube machine. What that means is that in order for me to hear you, you have to speak up. So let's try again, but louder. Can I get an amen? amen. OK, I heard that. That was better. Remember, we're on YouTube, so let's keep the volume up. Regardless of whether a sermon is in person, on, or on a remote platform like this, for me, the sermon always begins not with an idea, but with an emotion, a feeling that I want to capture and communicate, and perhaps even to engender in you who are listening. There are many emotions that I've been feeling in recent months. First, sheltering in place from the pandemic, and then watching the horrific video of George Floyd having the life choked out of him. So many emotions. Too many, in fact, for this one sermon. This sermon could have been about despair. I have certainly felt despair at many moments during the past weeks and months. Despair over George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others who've lost their lives in altercations with police. Despair over Armand Arbery, and before him, Trayvon Martin, and others whose deaths never made it into broad public consciousness. Despair over a president who seemed as incapable of compassion and empathy as he is adept at the politics of denial and disintegration. But more than anything, I have felt despair over the American people. Though I was born here, though I grew up here, though I went to school here, though I speak the language and read the newspapers here, I cannot understand and I despair over a people who can elect and even revere such a monster. Though cheered by the polls suggesting the margin of majority is shifting away from Trump and all he represents, I still despair over the large minority that have not turned away. 
Yes, there were empty seats at the Trump re-election rally in Tulsa, but there were filled seats as well. And every place taken in that hall of misery is a seed for despair. But this is not a sermon about despair. This sermon could have been about anger. I get angry every time someone believes that whiteness comes with the privilege of lynching with impunity. Never in my most testosterone-crazed frenzies would it occur to me to grab my gun and follow someone who looks suspicious. Who does that without even a moment of hesitation? Who does that without even an ounce of trepidation? I know with certainty there would be a voice in my head saying, fool, what are you doing? This is illegal. This is going to ruin your life and put you in jail. Put down that gun, foolish man. The absence of that voice in the minds of some who hold the privilege of whiteness is what makes me angry. I also get angry over what we all now refer to as the talk. You know, that conversation that black parents have when their sons and daughters reach puberty, if not sooner. That uncomfortable conversation that isn't about the birds and the bees, but rather is about how to survive the policing of black America. I get angry because it is inevitably a conversation about how to bow down before power. An earlier generation was warned to step off the sidewalk to let white people pass, to avert your gaze, to say yes sir and yes ma'am, to answer to boy and girl even when grown, and to auntie and uncle even when obviously of no relation. The contemporary talk is but an updated version of those earlier generational messages about how to get along with people who want to kill you and who can do so with impunity. I get angry because even in 2020, the talk we black parents give our black youth isn't about self-respect, it is about self-preservation. The talk isn't about living with dignity, it is about surviving in its absence. It isn't about holding your head up high, making eye contact, speaking with pride and authority. It is about keeping your hands visible, making no sudden moves, and saying, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. How little has changed. This talk could be from 1920 or 1820 as easily as it is from 2020. I'm not suggesting we martyr our children. The time to speak truth to power is not when you are staring into the barrel of a service weapon. The talk remains as important today as it was a century ago, but don't expect me to not be angry about it. But this is not a sermon about anger. This sermon could have been about exhaustion. Institutionalized racism is exhausting. It is like that stain you can't get out. It is a stain so tightly fused to the fabric of American life that it has become the color of America. I get exhausted thinking about my mother's generation, that hardworking, self-sacrificing generation that toiled in America's factories and fields, that fought America's wars and was rewarded with this, a social security system founded in 1930 to alleviate the poverty of old age, but that at its inception excluded domestic and agricultural workers. At the time, two-thirds of black Americans were domestic and agricultural workers and were excluded. My father's generation, that hardworking, self-sacrificing generation that toiled in America's factories and fields, that fought America's wars, and was rewarded with this. Exclusion from post-war mortgage lending programs while simultaneously segregated into red-lined neighborhoods. Home ownership and the rising value of one's property have long been the primary means by which average Americans accumulate wealth. 
the systematic exclusion of black Americans from this source of wealth means that a raging river of racialized disadvantage flows from our parents, flows through us, and still drowns our children. The average black household has an accumulated wealth of $17,000, while the average white household has accumulated $170,000. The hard work of generations of black labor leading to such a disparate outcome. The truest believers in the American dream ending in such a nightmare of disappointment. That feels exhausting. But this is not a sermon about exhaustion. By now, I'm sure some of you are exasperated enough to be typing in the chat, what is this sermon about? Well, bear with me. I'm almost there. There's just one more thing this sermon could have been about. It could have been about hope. Despite all that came before, hope is one of the things that I have been feeling. You know what gives me hope in these despairing, angering, and exhausting times? It is the shifts I see in America. These shifts happen every once in a while. The, the shift from British colony to independent nation. The shift from slavery to abolition. The shift from manifest destiny to indigenous nationhood. From keeping her barefoot and pregnant to universal suffrage birth control, and the right to choose. The shift from the casting couch to pound me too. From a nation in which black people could not vote to a nation that twice elected Barack Obama. There's no predicting when such shifts will occur. And yes, they're often followed by reversals that take us tragic steps backward or perhaps even wrongwards, if that were a direction. But I see one of these shifts happening now, and it gives me new hope. It is not just black people protesting police brutality. Sometimes the protest crowd is majority white. The white people joining those protests, pulling down those Confederate statues, demanding that police departments change or be defunded, or even change because they are defunded, those white people are not acting from their reality, they're acting from my reality. It is black reality that moves them. I've even found room in my heart for George W. Bush, something I never had while he was president. He acknowledges systemic racism, something the current president could never do. America is shifting. America is at one of those rare and precious inflection points, and that gives me hope. But with apologies to those of you that I am exasperating, I must say yet again, the sermon is not about hope. But now, I am at last ready to say what this sermon is about. The sermon is about resolve. Be it resolved that UUCA, that is, you and me, be it resolved that we will rise up. Rise up from this hot bed of rest and never lay down upon it again. Be it resolved that we will not bring that All Lives Matter sign to a Black Lives Matter demonstration. Would you bring a Colon Cancer Matters sign to a breast cancer rally? No. No, you would not. You would not. Because it is beside the point. Rise up. Be it resolved that you will not presume to say what people of color want if you've not talked to people of color. And if you've talked to me, you've not talked to people of color, you've talked to person of color. Person of color does not equal people of color. Rise up. Be it resolved that you will grasp the arc of Unitarian Universalist history. We are not people in the tepid middle. We are people of the burning edge. You do not advocate the abolition of slavery from the middle. You do not participate in the founding of the women's movement from the middle. You do not found the Red Cross 
from the middle. You do not give the world Louisa May Alcott, Bella Bartok, Alexander Graham Bell, Buckminster Fuller, Margaret Fuller, Oscar Hammerstein, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, Herman Melville, Sir Isaac Newton, Florence Nightingale, Linus Pauling, Paul Revere, Carl Sandburg, Albert Schweitzer, Mary Shelley, Henry David Thoreau, Frank Lloyd Wright, Whitney Young Jr., and innumerable other scientists, artists, and social justice pioneers who make up the vanguard of every generation in U.S. history. You do not give the world these people from the middle. And right here, right here in Atlanta, you do not stand arm in arm in defiance of hate, prejudice, and injustice from the middle. You do it from the burning edge. That is the arc of our history. We are not gadflies. Some of you are hard of hearing, so I say again, we are not gadflies. We are fireflies. We light the way. Rise up. Be it resolved that you will not get sucked into pedantic discussions intended only to distract you from what matters. Freedom of speech is not imperiled in the United States. The freedom to vote is. Freedom of speech is not imperiled in Unitarian Universalism. The moral imperative to care about more than the sound of your own voice is. Now, while I may be a liberal progressive, I do love conservatives, both in our nation and in our faith movement. They are necessary in a sound democracy and necessary in a sound faith. It's just that these days, it's hard to find a true conservative. Stoking racial hatred is not conservatism, it is demagoguery. Making college campuses emotionally unsafe for black and brown children and I don't care that they're over 18, they are still my children. Making those campuses unsafe by the tenor and tone of your discourse is not conservatism, it is abuse. Refusing to wear a mask during a pandemic is not conservatism. At best, it is irresponsibility. At worst, it is idiocy. Conservatives aren't riding around in golf carts shouting white power to black people. Those aren't conservatives, those are racists. If you're going to be a conservative at UUCA, for God's sake, be a real one, not one of those phonies. Rise up. And to end where I began, the defense lost that court case I was late for. I did get there in time to testify, but it was not enough. The death penalty was imposed. I and others on the, on the defense team lost that day, but I will not lose today. Be it resolved that you will not ask why we care about black men and women with criminal histories when they're gunned down. We care because a life does not have to be angelic to be holy. We are the religion of inherent worth and dignity, first, last, and always. May it be so resolved. Say amen so I can hear it.